Right now on Morning News Now, guilty. The armorer on the set of the movie Rust convicted of involuntary manslaughter just hours after the jury got the case. What comes next for Hannah Gutierrez-Reed and what that verdict could mean for the upcoming trial of actor Alec Baldwin. Also this morning, pressure is mounting on Israel to allow more aid into Gaza as the humanitarian crisis worsens by the day. Where ceasefire talks stand with the start of Ramadan just days away. Plus, State of the Union with the 2024 presidential election all but set. President Biden prepares to appear before the nation. What we know about his planned address as he tries to reassure a skeptical country that he's up to the rigors of his job. And fire up your flux capacitors from the power of love to the DeLorean itself. We're going behind the scenes of the hit Broadway musical Back to the Future in the debut of our new series, Curtain Call. Curtain Call. The question, can I fit into a DeLorean? <laughs> You're going to have to wait and see what the answer is. It's so cool we're starting the segment. Scott. Exactly. We're excited to bring that to you. Good to have you with us on this Thursday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Slaughter. We're going to get started this morning with a verdict in the trial over the shooting on the Rust movie set. A New Mexico jury found weapons supervisor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed guilty for her role in the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. This was the moment that the jury read its verdict to Gutierrez after deliberating for just under three hours. The trial, which centered on the 2021 shooting, lasted nearly two weeks. Gutierrez was found guilty of two counts of involuntary manslaughter. The jury returned a not guilty verdict on one count of evidence tampering. She now faces up to three years in prison. Her lawyers say they are going to appeal the verdict. In closing arguments yesterday, the prosecution said Gutierrez Reed acted irresponsibly while well, on the set of Rust. This is an involuntary manslaughter charge because she didn't know there were live rounds on set and the reason she didn't know was through her own negligence, her own recklessness. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to break it all down. So it took the jury just two and a half hours to reach this verdict. Guilty involuntary manslaughter, not guilty evidence tampering. Are you surprised at all or is this what you expected? Uh, I am not surprised as to the tampering. The only evidence there was that somebody saw a white bag of powder. It was never tested. So uh, not a surprise on the acquittal there. I, I suppose I am a little surprised that this was a guilty verdict. But if there was a case to be made, the strongest case was always against the armor. Uh, their defense mission was to point fingers at absolutely everyone else. Uh, but the state's case actually ended up being stronger than I expected. Uh, they had a lot of photographic evidence. They had a lot of testimonial evidence. They had a, lot, had a lot of statements from the defendant and others, which, by the way, if I can do a PSA, uh, again, this entire case was built against this armor, mostly on statements she gave uh, that were either on body cam video to the police or when she literally came in and sat down for interviews that all came back to haunt her mm. in this case against her. So there's my PSA. You don't cooperate in police's investigation if you're going to be the one they're going to use it against. Uh, but the bottom line is the case was made against the armor here. If there was one to be made, she did have the responsibility, even if other people shared that responsibility. She was the armor. So not a huge surprise that if there is a guilty verdict, it will be against her. I still think Alec Baldwin gets acquitted. Tell us more about how the prosecution laid out their case and what we did hear from them in their closing arguments. Uh, you know, you just saw a, a, a great clip. I mean, a, a great example that the prosecution uh, used was that, look, we're not saying Hannah Gutierrez-Reed intentionally put these live rounds on set. Uh, that's what negligence is. Through her negligence, they introduced photographs of guns being used negligently on the set to create an atmosphere that she was generally negligent while on set. They did a good job of introducing that evidence. Where I think they didn't do a great job is they promised at the outset, we'll show you where these live rounds came from. But ultimately, the sum of that evidence was, hey, um, who else could they have come from but the armor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed? But uh, whatever the case may be, they did make, an, uh, I thought, a good point that these different, the difference between dummy rounds, blanks, and live rounds are something that an armorer should have known if she was careful and was checking. But due to the negligence on the set, the live round ended up tragically uh, in a firearm that was capable of shooting it. Let's talk about the defense and first show just a moment from the closing argument from the defense yesterday. She could not anticipate what Baldwin would do. It was not in the script. It was not foreseeable. Management was responsible for safety failures and not Hannah. 
There's zero evidence of cocaine. There's no testing. And again, I go back to the idea that Hannah is a scapegoat for all the management failures. They do hope she gets convicted, so they're all exonerated. They can move forward. Since the jury didn't buy that argument, was it a strong argument to make? Can I make my second PSA? Yes. And it is this. If you watch this and you watch the Fulton County hearings in Georgia last mm. week, you saw or people commit the cardinal sin, which is the PowerPoint during closing with lots of words on it. And you, what you saw there was him reading from that PowerPoint. You're asking a jury to read while you read along and read. Should I read? Should I listen? Should I listen to you reading? Uh, I think this is a mm. just a cardinal sin. Uh, you should not do it. I Look at look at that cadence there. You saw it in that in that clip. Uh, not very dynamic. You end up just reading a book from a pulpit. Not exciting. So uh, that's my second and final PSA. But uh, the defense's arguments there were really just that other people did this. This was other people's responsibility. And really, ultimately, I thought in the end, the state had the stronger case showing that even if other people were responsible, they conceded that. That's a very effective tool in your closing argument for the state. They say the defense is going to come up here and say it was a bunch of other people's responsibility and that the armor was overwhelmed. And those are all good points. But at the end of the day, the armor, literally her name means that she is involved and has primary responsibility for the safety of the firearms. And these firearms were not safe, obviously. Speaking of other people, this all raises the question. Alec Baldwin, he's now charged with involuntary manslaughter, has pleaded not guilty, has said that he did not pull the trigger. What is the differences? What are the differences in these two cases? First, a guilty verdict here was good for Alec Baldwin. An acquittal would have been good for Alec Baldwin because it would have shown the state's case is weak against their strongest subject. Uh, but either way, Alec Baldwin's team has now gotten a first look at the evidence of the state. So all around a plus for Alec Baldwin. Now, Alec Baldwin's case is a lot different. He didn't have primary responsibility like the armor, and also key is going to be the operability, how the firearm works. The best evidence against Alec Baldwin is his stupid statements that he gave. Number one, uh, that he would never point a gun at anyone, and number two, that he didn't pull the trigger. Those two were dumb things to say. They will be evidence against him. All right, Danny. Appreciate your analysis. Thank you so much. Well, tonight on Capitol Hill, President Biden will deliver his high stakes State of the Union address as a rematch takes shape against presumptive GOP nominee Donald Trump. With his approval numbers still lagging, the president hopes to win over doubters and give his reelection campaign a shot in the arm. His goal, highlight accomplishments over the past three plus years and lay out the choice facing voters in November. For more on what we can expect tonight, we're joined by NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba and NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. Good morning to both of you. Yeah, Monica, let's get started with you. So this is actually the latest in the year that a State of the Union address has ever been delivered. What should we know about what we can expect tonight? Exactly, Savannah. As you said it, the stakes are high. The speech is very long. And some of the moments that might be the key takeaways are some of those unpredictable ones, things that even the White House can't plan for, but maybe is discussing how to handle if they do take place. And those are just some of the spontaneous moments, reactions in the chamber. But in terms of the content of the speech and the substance, this is really President Biden's opportunity, the White House says, to try to put everything he feels he's accomplished in the last couple of years in one bucket and try to frame why he wants to do that in another four years for his reelection in a separate bucket and try to marry those two themes and discuss that in this larger context domestically and internationally. Here's a little bit more of what we can expect from that kind of a message from the White House press secretary yesterday. You will hear the president lay out the historic achievements he has delivered on, on for the American people and his vision for the future. The president will outline an agenda that is about continuing to build on the progress that we've made over the last three years. The president has always been an optimistic person, as you all know, and even in the face of challenges that we have in front of us, he will share why he is hopeful about this country's future. So a major theme you're going to see here is the president talking about trying to lower costs for Americans, even though they may not be feeling all of the effects of that. And then also just talking about his economic plans while, of course, trying to nod to some of the issues of the other side of Republicans that he is going to be discussing without mentioning necessarily the name of his general election opponent now that that is set. 
of course, former President Trump. So, Ryan, let's bring you in here. The president's going to deliver this speech before a divided Congress, like really divided. This is going to be Republican <laughs> Speaker Mike Johnson's first State of the Union since winning the speakership. He'll be right behind the president in view of the cameras the entire time. What's he been saying about this? Well, Speaker Johnson has been very clear that he believes that there's a very different vision for America uh, between Republicans and Democrats. And, and we'll probably see that on display in the chamber uh, where maybe only half of the audience is standing and applauding at certain points uh, during the president's speech. But uh, Johnson did a bit of a pre yesterday where he laid out the big differences he sees between the Republican vision and the Biden administration vision. Take a listen to how he responded. If you had to describe in one word what you believe the State of the Union is, um, you've heard the word crisis, you've heard catastrophe, I think maybe a summary is decline. And I say that with great sadness, we all do. But it's because of this president and his administration that we are indisputably in decline. Uh, and so Republicans really painting a different picture of what the state of the union is. And what President Biden's going to hope to do, as Monica laid out, is demonstrate the accomplishments that his administration has been able to uh, get over the finish line over these past three years, while Republicans are going to argue that much of it hasn't worked. And that's one of the reasons that they believe this will be President Biden's final state of the union. Joe. Monica, immigration and the ongoing situation at the southern border is expected to be a big focal point for the president. What do we think we'll hear on that point tonight? I think you're going to hear the president repeat some of the things he said when he visited the border recently, which is to really take Republicans to task. He's going to argue for torpedoing the bipartisan deal that was on the table that really would have been some of the toughest reforms to the current immigration system, which the president, by the way, says is broken and which really would have provided some essential funding for personnel and additional border security. So I think the president is going to say something like we put this on the table. We had members of both parties working on it for months. There were negotiations. And then at the end of the day, Republicans did not decide to back it because of some comments he may link to or allude to from the former president. So I think he is going to be clear about that, even though we are reporting that he's not expected to announce any kind of executive action when it comes to immigration, even though that is something the administration has been considering. And it's possible they could do that at a later date, because I'm told by sources that they agree that they can't do nothing when it comes to the border, there's something that's going to have to happen if they can't get Congress to act, which it does seem is not going to be the likely path. Ryan, of course, after the speech, we're going to hear the Republican response that's delivered by Alabama Senator Katie Britt. That's a name that a lot of our viewers may not know terribly well. What should we know about her? What can we expect there? Well, Joe, she's certainly a rising star in the Republican Party, a 42-year-old mother, one of the youngest members of the United States Senate. And she's someone who is articulate and someone who Republicans really believe can share what they believe is the difference between the Republican agenda and the Democratic agenda. Of course, the response to the State of the Union is often a sought-after spot, but it's also an enormous challenge. It is very difficult to replicate the pomp and circumstance of, of what happens inside the chamber uh, with a speech that's usually delivered in a very quiet room directly to camera without applause lines and without the energy that you see inside the chamber. But many believe that Britt is up to the task. She is someone who uh, Republicans believe have a very bright future. Uh, she hasn't spent a lot of time in the media spotlight. She's worked a lot behind the scenes. This is her moment to introduce herself to the American public. Monica, this is really sort of essentially the Biden launch of a general election campaign now that we have the presumptive nominee in former President Trump. While exactly what he says might not necessarily be remembered by a lot of voters, a lot of people at home, how he says it, his performance, his demeanor might be, especially as questions about his age linger. How much of a concern and focus is that tonight? Well, the White House would say that you're going to see a very energized president tonight who is going to really put some of those concerns to rest. That is how they frame it, because, of course, this is a speech that is a teleprompter speech. He's been practicing it for several days. We know for years the president has talked about this. He struggles with a stutter, and sometimes he does have those issues with his delivery. But because they've been able to put all the prep into this, they don't really think that that's going to be an aspect of it. But the way that they're going to continue to counter those larger concerns, which we do see reflected in polls, 
polls is to go send the president on the road and to travel. He's going to be in Philadelphia tomorrow. He's going to be in Atlanta on Saturday. And I'm told that after the State of the Union, there's going to be kind of a massive travel blitz. We are going to be seeing the president out there and engaging with voters in a more personal way than we've seen in recent weeks. Savannah and Joe. All right, Monica and Ryan, thank you both very much. For more on the State of the Union, we're joined now by David Litt. He's a former speechwriter for President Obama and a best-selling author. Good to have you with us. No one better to help us understand what to expect tonight. So State of the Union's the stakes are always high, especially in election year, especially when President Biden looks at the polls and wants to be doing better. What do you expect to see tonight? Well, first of all, thank you for having me this morning. And I think that tonight, you know, as a speechwriter, I always thought, especially because I was, you know, a team of one of eight, and the State of the Union, it's a big night, but it's also more than just one night. Because for us in the speechwriting office for President Obama, we would be looking at the State of the Union almost as a guide for the next three to six months. If there was a speech coming up, we would say, what did the so to say about that? Right? That was a, a way for us and people throughout the government to think about the story the president wanted to tell about the country, about the moment, and as you pointed out, in this year, about the upcoming election. Walk us through what's kind of going on right now, maybe what's going on the past few days. You're part of a speech writing team. You're part of Obama's. How do you interact with the president about this? How is he preparing? And then what it all culminates in tonight? Well, every president is different. But I think one of the things that you've heard from President Biden's team is that the president is really involved in his own state of the union. Right? He has a speech writer. They're working together. But really, this comes down to the president usually talking with that person and going back and forth and trying to figure out how do I want to talk about this? What is the vision? What's on my mind? Because it's very, very rare these days that we know that millions and millions of Americans are going to be watching a speech. Usually at this point, we're watching clips of something, maybe 30 seconds, maybe less. So the idea, I mean, I think last year, 27 million Americans watched the State of the Union address. Um, that, that big an audience is really hard to get, even for a president these days. You are a writer, <clears throat> so clearly the words are incredibly important, but we can't ignore the fact of what the polls tell us, which are people are worried about his age. How important is the performance going to be here tonight? Well, I think performance is always important, but I also think that part of the White House's job and part of what you'll see from the Biden team is that we need to get past pure theater criticism, right? This election ultimately is not about Joe Biden or Donald Trump. In any election, it's about us. What are our next four years going to look like? And I think part of what you're going to see President Biden do tonight is lay out a vision for our next four years, not his next four years. He's going to be fine, right? Joe Biden's a very successful guy. The question is, what's, what are the rest of us going to experience? And the other thing I will say about this is, I would look for some of those unscripted moments. I don't know if you remember this, but last year, there was a lot of heckling from mm -hmm. yeah. members of Congress. I don't know when this became normal, but somehow it did. And so I think we're going to see some of those moments. That's frankly, I think where Biden was at his best last year. Mm. The speech itself was good, but he also, you know, he, he could dish it right back. And I think those are some of those things that, um, you know, maybe to put it charitably, some of his Republican friends might pretend he's not capable of. I think he'll be demonstrating that. Is that part of the prep, how to handle the heckling? <laughs> I don't think so. I think, you know, Joe Biden has been doing this for a long time. But I think that ability to show poise and, and uh, you know, uh, that unscripted moment can be just as powerful as the things that the speechwriters have been working on for months. All right. David Litt, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We're going to be previewing tonight's State of the Union address throughout the day here on NBC News Now. And our extensive live coverage of the address gets underway tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific. Well, Alabama's Republican governor has signed a new bill into law protecting IVF clinics. The bill protects providers and patients from lawsuits if embryos are destroyed. It comes in the wake of that controversial ruling from the state's Supreme Court last month that frozen embryos are people under law. The new bill will allow clinics to restart treatments that have been on hold. It passed with bipartisan support, and Governor Kay Ivey signed it just moments after it hit her desk. Critics say the law doesn't go far enough, but at least two fertility clinics in the state are prepared to resume treatments as soon as this week. Well, in Cairo this morning, ceasefire talks aimed at halting the war in Gaza and releasing both Israeli hostages as well as Palestinian prisoners have stalled without a breakthrough. Reports say representatives of Hamas have left Cairo, but that talks would continue to try and reach a deal by the start of Ramadan on Sunday. International pressure is mounting on Israel to allow more aid into Gaza. The UN's humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory says they're looking at a new route to get aid to Gaza's starving population. 
hunger has reached catastrophic levels, and especially in the north of Gaza, which we haven't served for, for weeks. We need to significantly scale up the humanitarian assistance in there. And that would be that, you know, we have to use this military road, this fence road at the side, on the eastern side, to allow material to come from the crossing point at Kerem Shalom and Rafa all the way up to the north and into the north. NBC News International correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv. Raf, good morning. So let's start with the ceasefire talks. Is there any chance that a deal is likely by the weekend? Savannah, it's looking very, very unlikely. As you mentioned, the talks in Cairo have broken up now without a breakthrough. It is not clear when we are next going to see negotiators getting back to the table. And these talks broke up with it sounding like both sides were pretty much at zero-sum positions. You'll remember Israel, the U.S., Egypt, and Qatar went to Paris. They hammered out a framework. That framework was presented to Hamas, and the hope was that they might say yes to it. Instead, Hamas came back with a counter-proposal with a lot of their original positions, including a demand to end the war entirely, something Israel says it won't do until Hamas is destroyed, and to withdraw all Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip, something Israel says it is not willing to do. So for those Palestinian civilians in northern Gaza, desperately short of food, for the hostages still being held, no sign of a breakthrough at this point. Guys. Yeah, Raf, I mean, many U.N. and relief agencies say Israel is blocking aid from getting into Gaza, where starvation is just becoming a huge concern. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about this growing pressure on Israel to let more aid in and how Israel is responding to all this. So the pressure on Israel is to both get more aid into Gaza, but also to make sure the conditions exist inside the Strip so that aid can be distributed. You heard from that UN representative earlier, the big problem is northern Gaza, where, according to humanitarian groups, both Israeli military restrictions and a complete collapse of law and order are making it very difficult to get that aid out. I asked an Israeli government spokesman about Israel's responsibility to make sure that aid can be distributed. Take a listen to a little of that conversation. Do you accept Israel is failing in that responsibility? So I can't address the issue of law and order because that's not a question for COGAT, but I can tell you that in terms of securing the convoys themselves, that is something that the international organizations are responsible for. They are responsible for How can they be securing... responsible? They don't have weapons. There are ways to secure these convoys in the same way that international organizations do so in many different places throughout the world where they have to deliver humanitarian aid. It is their responsibility to do so in this situation as well. Now, you have heard administration officials saying again and again, Israel needs to do more to get aid into northern Gaza, and it's likely to be a message that the president repeats tonight at the State of the Union. Guys. Raf, Israel also is facing global condemnation after it approved 3,500 new settlements in the occupied West Bank. That is considered illegal under international law. Tell us more about this. Explain this to us, and tell us also what we're hearing from the United States. What's reaction on this? So from the State Department, Savannah, we're hearing relatively standard language. They are criticizing this decision, saying the settlements are a barrier to a two-state solution. They're saying this is contrary to international law. But what we consistently see is the settlements in the occupied West Bank get bigger and bigger. And the Biden administration so far deciding not to take any actual measures to you know, punish, sanction the Israeli government for the settlement expansions. We have seen the administration put sanctions on individual settlers in the West Bank accused of committing acts of violence against Palestinian civilians, but no action against the settlements themselves. There had been something of a pause on the growth of settlements, but this right-wing government under Benjamin Netanyahu determined, it seems, to keep expanding them. Guys. All right. Raf, thank you so much. Time for a check on your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman is in studio with us. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yesterday, it was all about the rain across the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, parts of the, really, let's just say a whole third of the eastern part of our country. Instead, today, we're going to see a general drying trend. We do still have a couple of spots that are picking up some additional rain, but the system's on the way out. Places like New York, Washington, D.C., stretching down into the Carolinas, we're going to see drier conditions from here through the rest of your day. Those northern portions of New England, that's where we're still dealing with a 
little bit more of this rain that will start to wrap up here even as we get closer to lunchtime. But because of this additional rain, still dealing with a, a couple of flood watches that are in effect for parts of New Hampshire and Maine. That's it. All the others have since expired. Now, as we get rid of that system, we've got the next one that we're going to, of course, watch work through the middle of the country. Today, we're going to pick up some additional snow across parts of the, of the Rockies. We've got some rain to deal with and some strong storms that we'll have to track here as we get into the later parts of today and even after dark tonight. We'll show you that here in a moment. As we look ahead to tomorrow, we really start to see this system ramping up across the Great Lakes, the Midwest. We've got some heavy rain that we're going to expect. We've got some strong storms across parts of the south as well. And this system isn't done as we get through your Friday. By Saturday, it works a little farther to the east, and we've got soggy conditions on tap and the potential of a couple more strong storms uh, across parts of the south. So let's start with today. This afternoon and into this evening, we've got 6 million people under this risk of seeing some of these strong to severe storms. What do we have as far as impacts? Hail is going to be the thing we watch for uh, to have the greatest chance of occurring, about an inch or larger as possible. Uh, we'll also see the potential for some of those stronger wind gusts, and we can't rule out a tornado or two. By tomorrow, a much larger area at risk for some of these stronger storms. Again, afternoon and evening after dark, we could be talking about nocturnal tornadoes. We know how much more dangerous those are uh, once it gets dark. 20 million people at risk of this, including major cities, Dallas, Jackson, Mobile, New Orleans, all included in that for tomorrow. Same impacts will remain. And we, of course, have some heavy rain that we're going to track, too. Localized amounts, four to eight inches. I think widespread rain, an inch to two inches. But we know that the flooding concern will be there across this region here as we get through Friday, guys. Right. Never a dull moment in the weather department. No, guys. lots of <laughs> rain oh, this week, too. Yeah, All large right. hail. Ugh, Angie, thank you. Right. Coming up, the changing face of construction. Why more women are now choosing to build a career in a once male-dominated field. But first, Haiti on the brink. The country's prime minister is on U.S. soil as gangs control most of the capital. The big question now facing American leaders. Next. Welcome back. There's growing fear this morning that violence in Haiti could send the country spiraling toward a civil war. Gangs have taken over most of the capital, with the country's embattled prime minister currently in Puerto Rico, unable to get back to Haiti due to the violence. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. <laughs> Haiti is on the brink of civil war as it spirals into chaos. The U.S., along with a group of Caribbean nations, is pressing Haiti's prime minister to speed up a political transition. Aria Henri had been missing for days but landed in Puerto Rico. Clashes between heavily armed gangs and Haitian police have escalated after a mass prison break over the weekend. The White House says it will not send in American troops. We have underscored that now is the time to finalize a political accord to help set Haiti on a path to a better future. Right now, the near future looks bleak. Henri took office following the 2021 assassination of Haiti's president. We were there as the violence ramped up. This has become daily life here in Haiti. Tires burning on city streets, protesters furious. Now, gangs control about 80 percent of Port-au-Prince. The State Department is urging all Americans to leave immediately, but the main airport is shut down. In Miami, Haitian Americans are scrambling to evacuate loved ones. Human beings should be to be live in a peace. Not a, in a crime like that. Tony Jantano says his uncle went to visit his mother in Haiti, but now gang members are holding him for ransom. Your family is calling you, crying when you're about to sleep. This is crazy. This is terrible. Right now, it is not clear whether Haiti's embattled prime minister plans to return to the country. The White House says it is not helping him in Puerto Rico. Back to you. All right, Gabe, thank you. Now to other international headlines, starting with the latest on the war in Ukraine. NBC international correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. The uh, sound of a large explosion shook the city of Odessa yesterday, just as President Zelensky and the Prime Minister of Greece were on a tour around the southern Ukrainian city. Now, President Zelensky stated the explosion left an unknown number of people dead and wounded, while the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis stated that it is one thing to hear about war and quite another to experience it firsthand. The two visited sites of destruction in Odessa, including the memorial site of the most recent, most recent major attack on the city, a Russian strike on a civilian apartment building that left 12 people, including five children, dead. 
now to Mexico City, where protesters used a pickup truck to ram down the doors of the city's national palace. They were able to enter the palace before they were being driven out by security. Now, the protest is one of many over the years regarding the abduction and murder of 43 students a decade ago. The mass disappearance of students is still one of Mexico's most infamous human rights cases. President Andres Manuel López Obrador called the protest a plan to create a provocation, stating the door will be fixed, it's nothing. Now finally to Naples, where Venus stands tall once again. A new version of Michelangelo Pistoletto's Venus on the Rags was unveiled after the original work was destroyed in a suspected arson attack. The statue displays the Roman goddess of love and beauty with a heap of rags. It is supported by the remains of what su that survived from the fire back in July 2023 and undergone a careful restoration to appear apparently identical to its original. Now, Pistoletto first made Venus on the, of the Rags back in 1967. Now, having made several versions, it's considered one of the most iconic works of the 20th century. She will remain in Naples' Piazza del Municipio for the next three months. Back to you guys. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Coming up, a transit crime crackdown. New York's governor taking drastic new measures as subway crime surges. That's up next. We're back with a new order from New York Governor Kathy Hochul that's addressing the wave of violent crime in the city's subway. She's now deploying hundreds of National Guard members and state police officers to protect passengers. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more. In New York City, subway riders are on edge. I don't feel safe. Crime is rising on the trains, according to NYPD data. In recent weeks, multiple violent assaults, including this terrifying moment, when a woman bashed cellist Ian Forrest in the head, performing on a subway platform, the second time he's been attacked. They say lightning doesn't strike twice, but this was a terrible moment of deja vu. Today, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul said she is assembling a team of 1,000, including the National Guard and state police, to help secure the massive transit system. These brazen, heinous attacks on our subway system will not be tolerated. Teams will be stationed at the busiest and most problematic stations, searching bags. Civil liberties activists calling it overreaction and overreach. Do you think you will have an impact on weapons getting on the subway with these bag searches? Absolutely. It's a, first of all, it's a deterrent. Uh, and uh, if anyone's uh, thinking of coming into the subway system with a weapon, there's probably a good chance they're going to get caught. Mike Kemper is the NYPD transit chief. The big problem, he says, is repeat offenders. We arrest people all the time that have 50-plus arrests, 100-plus arrests. The dramatic moves in New York happening as 77% of Americans are concerned about a rise in crime, even though FBI data shows violent crime has been dropping nationwide since a spike in 2020. But multiple cities are taking steps to crack down. In Philadelphia, the chief of transit police vowing to aggressively combat crime after three deadly shootings in a week involving the city's buses. Eight teenagers shot today alone. We're going to target every criminal code on the books. In San Francisco, voters passed two measures on Tuesday aimed at law and order, including expanding police surveillance tools with more cameras and drones. In New York City, they will also be adding cameras. In this control center, they can see every station. Soon, they will have cameras on every subway car. Our thanks to Stephanie Goss for that report. The transit chief says the bag search teams are going to rotate stations and they'll focus on busy places where they're seeing security problems over and over again. Mark Claxton joins us now for more on this. He's the director of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance and a retired NYPD detective. Good to have you with us. So first of all, just help us understand, do we know what's behind some of these subway attacks and the alarming uptick we're seeing? Well, uh, I think everyone understands that the crime can be cyclical. Uh, sometimes there are uh, other events outside of what are traditionally uh, considered to be feeders of crime that lead to these sporadic uh, changes and fluctuations in the crime rate itself. I think what the uh, police officials have indicated is part of the, uh, the thing that's feeding this crime wave, uh, this uh, minor blip in criminal activity, is the recidivism rate of individuals who are repeat offenders a small number of individuals uh, in the system who are conducting and committing 
the largest amount of crime and criminal activity throughout the system. We just heard Mike Kemper, the NYPD transit chief, tell our correspondent, as we're discussing right now, that a lot of these attacks are being committed by repeat offenders who have these lengthy rap sheets. How do you stop them from committing more crimes? I, I think people hear that and they're like, how do we keep letting that happen? What's the solution? I, th I think uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, light is the best disinfectant, so to speak. And I think the fact that people are, are really addressing the issue of uh, this, what appears to be a lax uh, system that allows individuals who commit even the most violent uh, offenses to continually be allowed back on the streets is really causing uh, a lot of duress and stress out on the streets and increasing our crime rate. So I think focusing, correctly focusing on uh, those individuals who are responsible for uh, uh, putting those people back on the streets is really a good uh, strategy. Governor Hochul says this new plan is absolutely different, an absolutely different dynamic from NYPD's very controversial stop and frisk policies. Those were found to be discriminatory. They were later ruled unconstitutional. How are these bag checks different? I think this whole operation is an expansion of uh, a collaboration that existed in, in like from October of 2022 between the city and the state. The same uh, resources were provided to the city just based on the mayor's uh, subway safety plan uh, back then. The difference, the main difference here now is that the, the deployment of uh, state resources, the state police and uh, the National Guard are, are moving from just the four major transportation hubs to throughout, throughout the system. And they've introduced these bag checks. What they have indicated is that the bag checks, checks will be random, randomized bag checks. That means you may be stopping every 10th person, regardless of race, color, cre ethnicity. You'll stop uh, a certain pattern of individuals, and that will uh, prevent it from being even the possibility of targeting uh, individuals in the system itself. So it's it's an expansion of a, an already uh, a wonderful collaboration between the city and state with a twist. All right. Mm. Mark Claxton, thanks for joining us this mm -hmm. morning. Appreciate it. Coming up, a massive cyber attack targeting hospitals, doctors' offices, and pharmacies. The impact it's having on patients and what you need to know next. We're back with the fallout from a major cyber attack that's wreaking havoc on medical providers across the country. A unit of United Healthcare called Change Healthcare was recently forced to shut down parts of its operating system after hackers targeted its billing departments. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz explains how the attack is now impacting doctors, pharmacies, and patients all across the country. Thank you for calling Magnolia Pharmacy. At Magnolia Pharmacy in Los Angeles, it's been two weeks of chaos. It's impacting everybody, pharmacies, patients. The pharmacy left in limbo from a cyber attack on Change Healthcare, the nation's largest medical claims processing company that for days has prevented many providers from filling patients' prescriptions. This pharmacy has moved to an entirely new server so they can now process their prescriptions. But it's not a perfect fix. They still can't look at patients' insurance information or take coupons for name brand drugs. Sometimes it takes one hour to two hours for one single patient to find their insurance. Change, which is owned by United Health Group, says it processes 15 billion transactions a year and works across more than 67,000 pharmacies. The $590 we paid out of pocket. Sienna Keller you know, says she had no choice but to pay out of pocket for what her stepdaughter needs to treat her diabetes. That's a lot of money. Yeah, then I don't know how much longer we can really afford to go through it. Change Healthcare not responding to reports it's believed to have paid a $22 million ransom to the hackers. In a statement, the company saying it is working closely with law enforcement and that it's implemented workarounds to help bring some systems back online. In the meantime, experts say patients should ask their doctors about obtaining drug samples or lower cost alternatives. This system needs to get fixed. A massive disruption showing how vulnerable and interconnected our healthcare system is. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Well, it's Women's History Month. We've got a cool one for you. We're going to take a look at some of the women changing a traditionally male-dominated industry, construction. Reporter Jessica Cunnington from our New York affiliate WNBC has more on what's drawing them to the field. 
from ground level to high above New York City. Isabel Wong and Liana Balestra building the foundation of their careers in construction. So we got the four hoists going all the way. Supervising teams on site at projects like this skyscraper in downtown Brooklyn and getting hands-on experience in different management roles as part of the two-year career start program with Suffolk Construction Company. It's always something different and I love it the people aspect of this industry. It's really taught me about coordinating with other trades simultaneously and having them work together. You have plumbing risers going up. Neither had plans to get into construction, but were inspired to jump in after being exposed at previous jobs after college. I just really grew really fascinated in the industry. And to be honest, I saw that there's so much innovation to come in this industry. Being part of the change in a male-dominated industry. Going into it, it was definitely difficult, but there are a lot more women coming in this industry, and I find a lot of women mentors who could help me and bring me up. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, just 10.8% of construction workers across the U.S. are women. In this program, 40% of participants are women. You get a diversity of um, perspective and approach, and you know, if you've got the same guys doing the same thing generation after generation, you don't innovate. The more women that we see coming into the industry, the more women we can attract. Working to bridge the gender gap in construction. This is layout for a demising wall. To pave the way for the next generation. We're seeing growth, some na some natural, gradual growth in that space. Um, but there's still more to be gained here. There have been years and years of gender barriers. Um, and I think those are breaking down. I think that as companies do take it seriously, they start listening to the women at the table. This is a big job, yeah. Wong and Balestra planning to be at that table and help bring the industry to new heights. I hope to see a lot more other women in construction in the future. There's a lot of people that want to see you succeed and just go for it. I thought I would never do this, but I did the experience and I loved it. And I, I don't think I would see myself anywhere else right now. Good for them. It's so cool. Our thanks to Jessica Cunnington from our affiliate here in New York for that report. Some financial headlines now. Facebook bringing a AI straight to your main feed. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money headlines. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so Meta is overhauling how Facebook recommends videos across reels, groups, and the main Facebook feed. So the company is using AI to power its recommendation algorithm and plans to use it in all places that show video. Speaking at an investor conference, the head of Facebook says this is part of a technology roadmap for the next few years. Meta has made competing with TikTok a top priority ever since the video sharing app exploded in popularity. Facebook says when it tested the new algorithm, watch times went up by about 10%. LinkedIn is back up and running after a brief outage yesterday that affected thousands of users. The business-focused social network, which is owned by Microsoft, has apologized for the inconvenience. Now, there's no indication the problem is connected to the technical issue that Meta ran into on Tuesday when Instagram and Facebook went down for a few hours. And listen to this. Shake Shack is celebrating the biggest night in Hollywood by making movie fans winners. The fast food chain will offer customers a free bite if the Oscars runs long or short. Now, if the show is more than three hours, 31 minutes, customers will get a free chicken shack on Monday. If it's under that time, you can get a free smoke shack burger with a minimum purchase of $10. You'll have one week to claim your sandwich in store, online, or on the Shake Shack. Yeah, guys. So there'll be people right. going, over, go longer. We want, we want, I want the chicken shack. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Longer speeches. Longer speeches. Yes. All right. <laughs> Savannah, thank you. Thanks. You Coming up, Broadway hits 88 miles per hour. Yeah, we're going behind the scenes of the hit new musical, Back to the Future, next. Welcome back. Who could forget the dramatic and controversial final scene of The Sopranos? Tony sits in a booth with his family while Don't Stop Believing played in the background. The door opens. 
And then it cuts to black. Well, the booth in that scene right here, it just sold for more than $82,000 on eBay. Right now, the booth is sitting in an ice cream parlor in Bloomfield, New Jersey. The crime boss's tabletop was on the brink of falling apart, so the owners put it up for auction. The winning bidder, who has not been announced, will get the booth, the table, the divider, and the family plaque that reserves the seats for the Soprano family. Was that you, Joe? It Bye. was not me, no. But I wonder if the booth knows what actually happened to the Sopranos Great. in that last scene. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Savannah. <laughs> Let's end this hour with a curtain call. This is the debut of a new series here on Morning News Now. It's your front row ticket to some of the hottest shows on Broadway and beyond. And we're kicking things off with a hit musical that's based on a popular movie you may have heard of. It's called Back to the Future. I grabbed my favorite retro jacket and sat down with star Casey Likes and writer Bob Gale to find out how they brought our favorite time traveling DeLorean from the roadway to the Great White Way. It's a blast from the past as Broadway goes back to the future. Great Scott! It surpassed my expectations. I had high expectations, and this show really did exceed my expectations. Gale wrote the screenplay for the original 1985 movie and has now written the book for the musical. Go, Donnie, go, go. Actor Casey Likes is the one donning that iconic red puffy vest. How does it feel to tell people you're playing Marty McFly? It feels pretty good and people know what it is and you see the reaction of what it means to them. There are pros and cons to that because then people have an attachment to the character already. Do you feel that sort of weight sometimes? As hard as it is to to condense what Michael J. Fox is in this role into, you know, a, a different performance, it it is also a little bit easier to know that I know what you love and I love it too. So I'm gonna give you what you love and I'm also gonna bring my own thing and I'm gonna marry them together. That includes mastering 1955. Those voice cracks. Can you give us a quick example? Hold on, wait a minute, Doc, you're telling me that about the time machine out of a DeLorean? The musical follows the same plot as the movie, mixing in new original songs with tunes synonymous with the film. Some of the most famous quotes make a cameo, too. I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet, but your kids are going to love it. People often say, when are you guys going to do Back to the Future Part 4, right? And our answer is never because who wants to see a Back to Future movie without Michael J. Fox? So our challenge, our goal was let's give people an experience that will make them feel as good as they felt the first time they saw the first movie. In the stage version, you could say the time-traveling DeLorean is a co-star. Dazzling effects make it feel like the car is actually hitting 88 miles an hour. We took a closer look. Casey, what, what should I know about your ride here? Uh, well, what you should know is that it's small and that it's <laughs> not a normal size DeLorean. So, so you have to kind of get in with your feet first and then your butt and then move your legs around the wheel. Got it. So it's not... Um, I'll tell you. I'm 6'3". <laughs> Will I fit? So, uh... Flash to the future. And then I think... Uh, this might be the extent of my <laughs> driving it. Does this work? Does this look cool? I like it. Great, man. <laughs> Is this, can you drive a DeLorean with your feet up? Yes, door? yes, yes. <laughs> Best to leave the driving to the show's young star. It hits me. How old are you? I am 22. I just turned 22 a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Yes. Which was how old Michael J. Fox was when, when we did the movies. All right, so there's a connection there, right? Yes, yes there is. At the same time, the movie, what, came out 17 years or so before you were born? Yes, it did. It was um, my mom's first date. Really? Yes, yes. It was my mom's first date, and uh, ironically, it was uh, she was more interested in Michael J. Fox than she was with the guy who was on a date with her. That's Calvin Klein. Oh, my God, he's a dream. Have you met Michael J. Fox? I have. What yes. was that like? He's not only an inspiration uh, for this character and, and as an actor, but, uh, but as a person. So uh, getting to thank him for all that was really special. And then um, right before I went on stage um, for our opening night gala, I asked him, what is your advice? And he said, kick ass. And if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything, which is a quote from the movie. So it's just the best. 
the best. I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Did I? Did I? How did my uh, outfit hold up for the assignment? You're giving Marty. You are Am exactly. I? This is the, this is Marty. <laughs> so we're switching places tonight. Okay, so that's good. I can't sing. Is that a problem? Yes. Yes. <laughs> is your hope that this is like a Broadway institution? Of course. From your lips to God's ears. So knock on wood. If we get into DeLorean and we travel five, maybe even ten years in the future, here at the Winter Garden, it's going to still be here. So the show opened last August, is still going strong, and you can catch Back to the Future the Musical at the Winter Garden Theater here in Manhattan. So many shows opening right now. We'll have a lot of competition, but folks love this show. The lines yeah. are always wrapped around here. Do you remember how many is it again? How Some many? Shows oh, 18 in yeah, a wow. two-month period. Yeah. So <laughs> you have it. Yeah. There are plenty of options yeah. if but you want to see one. a show. <laughs> that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, it's looking like a 2020 rematch will play out in 2024. President Biden and former President Trump cruised to Super Tuesday victories this week. And now with former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley officially out of the running, we're looking forward to November. President Biden's third State of the Union address tonight. What we're expecting from the commander in chief as election season ramps up. Also this morning, in custody, the armorer in the fatal Rust shooting, which killed the film cinematographer, found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. We're going to take you inside the courtroom with Hannah Gutierrez Reed's emotionless reaction to the verdict and how long she could spend behind bars. Plus, how this case might affect actor Alec Baldwin's upcoming trial this summer. Another mid-air scare that's reigniting safety concerns aboard some Boeing jets. Bright flames captured on video erupting from the engine of a United Airlines flight just moments after takeoff. What happened next? Plus the scathing new testimony on Capitol Hill over Boeing's other high-profile incidents. Later in the hour, we are flipping the script with the immensely talented Jermaine Fowler. He's an actor, producer, and comedian whose latest, latest project, Ricky Stenicki, is out today showing the hilarious up-and-comer now taking the lead. Excited to bring you that conversation coming up in a little bit. Of course, we are going to begin this hour in Washington, where President Biden is set to deliver his third State of the Union address tonight before a joint session of Congress. The president's speech is being viewed as the kickoff to this year's general election with a rematch this fall against presumptive GOP nominee Donald Trump. Mr. Biden is expected to tout his administration's accomplishments while also looking ahead to the future. Of course, NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us with a preview. Hey, Gabe, good morning. As you mentioned, with the exit of Nikki Haley, that Biden-Trump rematch is taking shape. And tonight, the stakes could not be higher. The president is expected to lay out his vision for a potential second term and propose new taxes on large companies and billionaires. With the race for the White House kicking into high gear after Super Tuesday, this morning President Biden is preparing to deliver perhaps the most significant address of his presidency. The president will outline an agenda that is about continuing to build on the progress that we've made over the last three years. The president expected to hammer several themes in this State of the Union address, an improving economy, reproductive rights and preserving democracy. And despite trailing Mr. Trump in recent polls on securing the border, President Biden is expected to highlight his immigration policies after House Republicans tanked a bipartisan border security bill. Still, he faces a slew of challenges as election season ramps up, persistent voter concerns about his age, his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, with some Democrats voicing their disapproval by voting uncommitted in recent primaries, and high food prices due to inflation. Attack my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. Last year, some Republican members of Congress interrupted his address. This year, the White House says... He's ready for anything, as you saw him literally do that last, last year. The speech coming as the general election rematch takes shape. After Donald Trump won almost every Super Tuesday state, his rival Nikki Haley suspended her campaign. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. 
the former president securing the endorsement of Mitch McConnell, who had sharply criticized him over his conduct on January 6th. Recent polls show Mr. Trump leading President Biden within the margin of error. And after skipping GOP primary debates, Mr. Trump is now calling on President Biden to debate him anytime, anywhere, any place. He's the worst president in the history of our country. The Biden campaign won't commit to a debate just yet, saying that's a conversation we'll have at the appropriate time and urging Mr. Trump to watch the State of the Union. Now, after tonight's address, the Biden campaign is planning a travel blitz to battleground states in the coming weeks. Joan Savannah. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. So as we heard there in Gabe's report, we're expecting the state of the economy to be a big part of the State of the Union address tonight. It's an issue that remains a top priority for voters heading into this year's election, of course. So how is the economy performing? NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung is at the big board for us this morning. Uh, no matter how many issues we talk about when it comes to an election, James Carville said many years ago, it's the economy, stupid. So big picture, what does the economy look like right now under President Biden? Yeah, well, that's why the state of the economy is likely to be part of the state of the union. So let's unpack what the economy looks like right now. Unemployment, 3.7% for context. That's near a 50-year low of 3.4%. But the big story for the Biden, uh, Biden administration is obviously, as Gabe was mentioning, inflation, right? Prices across the board on a yearly basis going up by 3.1%. Economists say where we really want to be is 2%. So for that reason, still a lot of work to do. The Biden administration acknowledges that. But Overall, the story is that we, we are growing. So the economy growing by 3.1% in 2023 over the average of 2021 to 2023 during the Biden administration. The average was about 3%. So we did not contract during the Biden administration. But again, the story here, inflation, inflation, inflation remains the issue for the Biden administration. So how are voters feeling about the economy under the president? What is the current attitude? Yeah, well, polling shows that the economy remains top of mind. And this actually comes from a New York Times Siena College poll. It asked people, well, compared to this time a year ago, how do you feel about the economy? And check this out, 40% say worse. And this is interesting because when you take a look at those numbers that I just showed you, they're improved from last year. Inflation was higher last year. Unemployment remained about the same, but inflation was actually worse in 2022 compared to 2023. So the story here is that people are perceiving the economy to be worse. And the big reason is because of food prices. Now, keep in mind, inflation, the number is going down, that rate is going down, but it's still positive. So prices are going up, albeit at a slower pace. That means that people are still seeing price tags rise at the store. That's a reason why of that perception of the economy is the way it is. So looking ahead to the State of the Union tonight, what economic policies do we expect the president to talk about? Yeah, well, because if he's trying to make a stump speech for another term in office, he has to say, well, what is he doing right now and what does he want to build on? So we've seen junk fees very much in vogue because he wants to really message to the consumer. We're trying to take care of things like credit cards, uh, ticket fees. If you're trying to get a ticket to Taylor Swift, for example, uh, he announced a strike force earlier on this week. But infrastructure, building roads, antitrust, trying to use the FTC to break up large merger deals like JetBlue and Spirit, for example, chips, drug prices, also part of the IRA, uh, IRA the inflation. Reduction Act, and then student loans, obviously trying to uh, excuse all of the uh, loan debt that we've seen uh, running into issues at SCOTUS, but still trying to figure out other ways of forgiving some forms of student debt. These remain the issues that he's going to talk about, uh, likely to talk about in that State of the Union address tonight. So, Brian, you've showed us some comparisons of, you know, a year ago or so, which was, of course, still in President Biden's term. After Super Tuesday, though, former President Trump had made a point of highlighting his economic record pre-pandemic, saying it was better than President Biden's record. Show us some numbers comparing those two. Yeah, and I also want to add that one thing about looking at the overall numbers is that, while you can't attribute everything everything just to one president. There are other factors at play. So let me just uh, lay, lay out basically the pre-COVID numbers, right? So if we're talking about January 2020 during the Trump administration, unemployment, 3.6%, inflation, 2.5%. Where are we now? 3.7% on unemployment, a slight tick up, but basically a, 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 a negligible movement. And then inflation certainly higher at 3.1%. So, but overall, it looks about the same. And we have to remember that the context is not really necessarily of just the policies themselves, but we went through an unprecedented pandemic in the middle of that, right? The 2020 pandemic, unemployment soared to 15% in 2020, and inflation rose to as high as 9 
percent in 2022. Again, COVID happening is not the fault of any of these presidents. But this is the context by which we're talking about the economy is still that shock of the massive thing that we went through in 2020. So that's a big story that we have to remember when we talk about these numbers uh, as part of this conversation. All right, Brian, thanks for laying those numbers out. We appreciate it. And you can watch the State of the Union address tonight from 8 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now, 9 p.m. Eastern on NBC. You can also follow reaction to the speech throughout the night on NBCNews.com. Now let's get to New Mexico, where film set armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is in custody after a jury convicted her of involuntary manslaughter for the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins back in 2021. The big question now, what does this verdict mean for Alec Baldwin's upcoming trial set for July? NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas joins us with the latest. Chloe, good morning. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. 26-year-old Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is now awaiting, awaiting sentencing for that charge. Helena Hutchins' family says that they are satisfied with the decision, but they want everyone responsible for her death to be held accountable. Now, this summer, actor Alec Baldwin, he is going to be going on to his criminal trial for his role in the shooting. And many are wondering, like you said, if Gutierrez-Reed's verdict is going to help him or is it going to hurt him? More than two years after cinematographer Helena Hutchins was fatally shot on the New Mexico set of the Alec Baldwin-led movie Rust, armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty. After a nearly two-week trial, the jury deliberated for just two and a half hours. Juror Albert Sanchez spoke to NBC's Dana Griffin moments after the verdict came down. Do you have light rounds there? And you don't even know it? And you're not checking it? There's a problem. The 26-year-old now in custody awaiting sentencing could face up to 18 months in state prison. When the verdict was read, Gutierrez-Reed remained stone-faced while her mother sobbed. During the trial, Gutierrez-Reed's actions leading up to the shooting coming under fire. She was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. Dave Hall's the film's assistant director who handed the prop gun loaded with live ammunition to Baldwin, giving emotional testimony, detailing the moments after Hutchins was shot. What did you say? Are you all right? Did she respond? Yes. She said, I can't feel my legs. Halls took a plea deal for negligent use of a deadly weapon last year. Defense attorney Jason Bowles, who doubled down on blaming Baldwin in closing arguments, says they will appeal the verdict. The evidence wasn't sufficient to convict. In a statement, Hutchinson's family responding to the verdict, saying in part, we are satisfied that the jury found Gutierrez Reed guilty for her part in the taking of Helena's life and look forward to the justice system continuing to make sure that everyone else who is responsible for Helena's death is required to face the legal consequences for their actions. This summer, Baldwin, who was holding the gun when it discharged, will face one charge of involuntary manslaughter. The actor has pleaded not guilty and has repeatedly denied responsibility. I didn't pull the trigger. The verdict bringing this tragic Hollywood story one step closer to an ending. So NBC News, we've reached out to Alec Baldwin's attorneys for comment, but we haven't yet heard back. And like we said, you know, he is gearing up for his criminal trial, and that is set to begin in New Mexico this July. All right, Chloe, thank you so much. Let's now bring in NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sanadella for some perspective on this verdict, what we could expect in that trial against Alec Baldwin. Angela, thanks for being here. So I want to start with, with yesterday's verdict, of course, but also the fact that throughout her trial, we did not actually see Hannah Gutierrez-Reed take the stand. Do you think that helped her, hurt her? What do you think it was that led the jury to find this decision? So Savannah, look, even though this is worst case scenario for her, I think it would have just been worse if mm. she had taken the stand. She would have had to answer her questions like was that cocaine in the baggie yours this way she didn't have to do it there was a chance that she could have proven there was some reasonable doubt the cocaine is relevant it was a second charge with the evidence tampering that was dropped but or sorry that was that was not found guilty for but in terms of what the jury found I think it's because the prosecution made such a strong case that she not only messed up enormously in loading the gun with this live round but also a pattern of neglect the prosecutors here said that there were at least 12 days where there were live rounds on the set and she as the armor as the person in charge didn't even know we also heard very powerful testimony of people saying she was just pulling ammo out of her fanny pack and this is not what happens mm. on a movie set let's talk about alec baldwin he's also charged with involuntary manslaughter was pleaded not guilty says he did not pull the trigger 
set to go to trial this July. How are these cases different? Does Baldwin have a better case here, do you think, than Gutierrez Reed? So I, I think he does. And I think actually this could possibly help him. And that's because the defense attorneys could use the prosecutor's own words here against the prosecutor in his case. Here the prosecution said it was her sole responsibility. She messed up here. And then the jury found him her guilty for this, in which case his team could say, look, Dave Halls has already pled guilty. She was found guilty. And it was not the actor's job once this cold gun was announced and given to him. But ultimately, it's again all going to come down to the industry standard. And we've heard all things here. Some people say the actor was not supposed to check the gun. Some people say the actor absolutely had to check the gun. So whether or not the defense or the prosecution convinces a jury what is the standard and what Baldwin did or did not do is going to be the what, what hinges on whether or not he's negligent here. Obviously, it's safe to assume, right, that Baldwin's team was watching this closely. How much of what we actually heard and saw here, evidence that was entered testimony is going to kind of carry over quite a bit. I think especially Dave Halls, the assistant director there, we saw his very emotional testimony. So the witnesses will be the same. Now, the cocaine, I think, is very relevant, though, and will likely not apply in his case. So there was this evidence tampering charge about her allegedly having passed off a cocaine baggie. Now, this wasn't even uh, she wasn't even found guilty of this. So why did the prosecution bring this? And it's in order to prove that she was using cocaine, allegedly. She was recreationally using drugs on the set, which created this pattern of negligence. And that's the only way they could have introduced this evidence to the trial. Now, for Baldwin, there likely will not be similar allegations of total neglect of recreational drug use. So I think in that regard, the evidence will be less against him. If you're Alec Baldwin's team right now, is this good news that this went the way it did? You know, I think it is good in that it puts responsibility squarely on the shoulders of other people. And then he can say, look, these other people were responsible. The prosecutors even said they were responsible. It was their job. Yeah. It was not my job. Angela Senadella, as always, we appreciate you. Thanks. Alabama fertility clinics have new protections this morning thanks to a new bill that Republican Governor Kay Ivey signed into law. Now, several clinics say they plan to resume treatments as soon as this week. Services across the state were suspended after the state Supreme Court's controversial ruling that frozen embryos are considered children. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Hey there, it's only been two weeks since that court decision brought IVF in Alabama to a standstill. The reaction and frustration so palpable that lawmakers managed to pass this legislation in record time. But real questions still remain about whether this new law can fully accomplish what it set out to do. This morning, fertility patients and doctors in Alabama hoping a new law will now pave the way for them to restart IVF treatments left on hold for the last two weeks. All right, 29 uh, hours, one day, Senate Bill 1, uh, 159, the Senate concurs. The new legislation signed overnight by Republican Governor Kay Ivey meant to shield IVF clinics from costly lawsuits. Civil damages now also sharply limited if an embryo is damaged or destroyed. This bill gives us the ability to immediately offer IVF care to our patients. State lawmakers under pressure to pass something fast after the Alabama Supreme Court found parents could sue for wrongful death when their frozen embryos were destroyed, causing clinics in the state to worry more lawsuits could follow, abruptly halting all IVF procedures. Now, some fertility clinics in the state still evaluating the new landscape. The University of Alabama at Birmingham, the state's largest hospital, saying it's moving to promptly resume treatments, but adding, we will continue to assess developments. But one clinic at the center of the state Supreme Court case telling local outlets, quote, we are not reopening until we have legal clarification. Patients like Megan Cole left in limbo for weeks, now hoping to restart the IVF process once again with the help of a surrogate. We're hopeful that although this has been probably the worst two weeks of our lives, that it will get back on track and we can move forward with but some lawmakers acknowledge the new law is only a temporary fix doing nothing to tackle the underlying reasoning of the court decision equating frozen embryos to children we're not addressing this the core central issue it is like putting a band-aid on a hemorrhaging wound when we're talking about refusing to address the actual constitutional crisis that we have created the situation in Alabama has been a cautionary tale for other states as well, like Florida, where proposed bills allowing wrongful death suits for embryo destruction appear to have been shelved for now. Back to you.
All right, Laura Jarrett, thank you so much. Rain, hail, damaging winds, even tornadoes are possible today for parts of the country. Andrew Lastman joins us with more. Hey, Andrew, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Joe, we've got uh, one exiting system that caused quite a mess across parts of the east yesterday. That is going to start to wrap up. But yes, you are exactly right. We've got some severe weather and another system we're watching track across the midsection of the country. That is where the bullseye is for the most impactful weather through the day today. I'll show you what that means here in a moment. But first, let's take a look at the lay of the land here as far as that system is concerned. It's going to move through the plains here as we get through the day today. Day. The severe risk targeting basically Texas to Kansas, a smaller area than what we'll see as we get into tomorrow, where we really see an expansive area that under the potential for some of that severe weather risk, and the heavy rain will also be on the table. As we get into Saturday, you guessed it, we've got rain in the forecast for the weekend across much of the east, specifically parts of the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, New England could even see kind of wintry mix as we get through your Saturday. Let's take a look, though, at the severe threat through the day today. Six million people, including Oklahoma City, Abilene, Brady, Dallas, all have the potential to see some of those stronger storms, even severe storms developing as we get through the afternoon and importantly into the evening hours after dark with those nocturnal tornadoes possible, although they'll likely be few and far between, but the, the uh, chance isn't zero. We'll have a better chance of seeing some of the larger hail inch or higher and of course some of those strong winds 60 miles per hour or higher. Big swath of the, the country though as we get into tomorrow, uh, under a flash flood risk, you can see some of the bullseye areas, Atlanta. Atlanta picked up a good amount of rain yesterday, a couple of inches, and with more on the way from this same system, not going to be hard for us to see some of that urban flooding in those low-lying areas, the areas that are often flood prone when we have a good amount of rain in a short time period. This stretches all the way to New Orleans, though, as you get through the day tomorrow. And yes, the severe weather will also be something we continue to watch into tomorrow. A larger area, 20 million people, same impacts, but now we've got folks from Dallas all the way out to the panhandle of Florida including New Orleans, Jackson, Little Rock, included in the potential for, for us to see some of those stronger storms. When it comes to rainfall amounts, we're expecting anywhere four to eight inches localized amounts, but I think a wider uh, swath of this area could see maybe an inch to two inches as we get through at least the end of the week. On the back side of this system, one thing to note, we're going to see some low humidity. It'll drop here as that system works through. We're also going to see the windy conditions behind it. So as we get through the day today, notice the areas that we're looking at fire threat. Uh, for some of that, those uh, more conducive conditions weather-wise does include Amarillo, Midland, uh, as we get through Roswell as well. Those are some things that we'll have to watch through the day today. But now let's head to the weekend, guys. Friday, almost here. We've got sunny conditions out west. That's the good news for your Friday. I showed you all the busy weather across basically the Great Lakes down to the Gulf Coast and back towards the Rockies. But the East Coast looks pretty good for tomorrow. The West Coast looks great for tomorrow. It's by the time we get on to Saturday that you see some of that unsettled weather working its way to the east. Mild conditions will last across much of the southern tier of the country. We'll see mild conditions even as far north uh, as folks in the northern plains for Saturday. It'll be a little soggy, though, for our friends on the east coast, and we'll also deal with a bit of uh, some rain and some, some snowy conditions across parts of the Pacific Northwest. But look at this. Savannah, this is for you. Winter beauty, right? <laughs> Mid-60s. It'll feel a little Why cooler doesn't it say by that the on your mat? <laughs> Winter beauty. Hey, there you I go. Like Winter when you put beauty. them on. <laughs> uh, you can't get that from from a weather app. Uh, windy and cold <laughs> exactly. across parts of the Northeast and the Great Lakes on Sunday. I think the good news is going to be the middle of the country. That's where it's at. Most of us will see some sunshine. We'll I love it. it. <laughs> I left them speechless. Winter beauty. All right. Thank you. You're a winter beauty. Thanks, <laughs> Andy. I gotcha. <laughs> Much more to come here on this hour of morning news now, including the reignited safety concerns over Boeing's jet fleet after this shocking video surfaced of flames shooting out of an engine on one of its planes this moments after takeoff. First, though, after the break, a subway crime crackdown here in New York will bring you Governor Kathy Hochul's new plan to keep the city's millions of riders safe. You are watching Morning News Now. We're back now with Governor Kathy Hochul's new plan to fight the recent spike in subway violence. Hundreds of National Guard troops and police officers will now be deployed across New York City's subway system in an effort to try and make it safer for passengers. Here's NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk with the details. In New York City, subway riders are on edge. 
I don't feel safe. Crime is rising on the trains, according to NYPD data. In recent weeks, multiple violent assaults, including this terrifying moment, when a woman bashed cellist Ian Forrest in the head, performing on a subway platform, the second time he's been attacked. They say lightning doesn't strike twice, but this was a terrible moment of deja vu. Today, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul said she is assembling a team of 1,000, including the National Guard and state police, to help secure the massive transit system. These brazen, heinous attacks on our subway system will not be tolerated. Teams will be stationed at the busiest and most problematic stations, searching bags. Civil liberties activists calling it overreaction and overreach. Do you think you will have an impact on weapons getting on the subway with these bag searches? Absolutely. First of all, it's a deterrent. Uh, and uh, if anyone's uh, thinking of coming into the subway system with a weapon, there's probably a good chance they're going to get caught. Mike Kemper is the NYPD transit chief. The big problem, he says, is repeat offenders. We arrest people all the time that have 50-plus arrests, 100-plus arrests. The dramatic moves in New York happening as 77% of Americans are concerned about a rise in crime, even though FBI data shows violent crime has been dropping nationwide since a spike in 2020. But multiple cities are taking steps to crack down. In Philadelphia, the chief of transit police vowing to aggressively combat crime after three deadly shootings in a week involving the city's buses. Eight teenagers shot today alone. We're going to target every criminal code on the bus. In San Francisco, voters passed two measures on Tuesday aimed at law and order, including expanding police surveillance tools with more cameras and drones. In New York City, they will also be adding cameras. In this control center, they can see every station. Soon, they will have cameras on every subway car. Our thanks to Stephanie Gosk for that report. Now let's get to international headlines, starting with the latest from the unruly gang violence in Haiti. NBC News international correspondent Claudio Lavanga joined us from Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. Well, that's right. The spokesperson for the governor of Puerto Rico confirmed that the prime minister of Haiti has landed on the island on Tuesday and is currently unable to return to his country. Now, Ariel Henry was last seen in public on an official visit to Kenya last Friday. Upon his return to Haiti, criminal gangs surrounded the main airport in the capital, Port-au-Prince, making, making it impossible for him to return. And the foreign ministry of the Dominican Republic, which borders with Haiti, said in a statement that the U.S. and Henry had asked the Dominican government for permission to, for his airplane to make an indefinite layover in the Dominican territory. But that permission was denied. Now let's move on to the world of literature. With news that 10 years after his death, a new novel by, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez will be published against his will. The novel, called En Agosto Nos Vemos, was written by the Nobel laureate in his final days when he was still struggling with the mean dementia. Now, Garcia Marquez told his sons to rip it up and never publish it because he said the novel just did not work and made no sense. Well, a decade later, anyway, his sons decided to publish it, saying they concluded the book was, even though it was unfinished, made a lot of sense and was very moving. And let's end this tour of the world, in the world of archaeology. A new research suggests that stone tools unearthed in a quarry in Ukraine in the 1970s belong to humans who used them more than a million years ago. Initially, archaeologists believed that the 90,000 stone tools discovered in the Ukrainian town of Korelovo dated back to 800,000 years. But Roman Garba, an archaeologist at the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague, used a new dating method that brings the clock back to a million years. But Garba said that a fresh date analysis of the artifacts reveals the earliest known presence of humans. Roman said that it's like a cosmic clock that unleashes human history. Wow. Quite amazing. Very, Back to you guys. Cool. Fine. That's All right, cool. Claudio, thank you. Coming up, another major mid-air scare making headlines this morning. After the break, our Tom Costello has the details on a pretty scary scene on board a United Airlines Boeing jet that had to make an emergency landing after flames were spotted erupting from one of its engines. Stay with us. 
Welcome back. Passengers on a United Airlines Boeing plane faced a mid-air drama Monday when flames exploded from one of its jet engines minutes into the flight. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello joins us with more on this. Hey, Tom, good morning. What can you tell us? You know, this really looks like a compressor stall. Uh, not a big deal. This happens when there's an airflow disruption in the engine. It causes the engine to spit fire out the back, almost like a backfire on a regular car engine. It's usually not a serious risk to the plane, but pilots do need to get the plane on the ground as soon as possible. It was a terrifying few moments okay, caught gentlemen. on video at altitude. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we realize something happened outside. Flames shooting out of the engine of a United Airlines flight, possibly an engine stall as the plane departed Houston en route to Fort Myers earlier this week. Stall the left engine. The aircraft, a Boeing 737, made an emergency landing back in Texas. United calls it an engine issue, adding the flight landed safely and the passengers deplaned normally. Boeing does not provide the engines for the planes. Elliot Trexler was on board. This was not a normal bump that you would hear when you're flying. This was a loud explosion. There was no question in any of our minds that something bad had happened. That combined with the plane nose diving and seeing the flames. It's the latest mid-air scare for passengers caught on video, and it comes during the ongoing fallout from that Alaska Airlines flight blowout back in January when a door plug flew off the Boeing 737 MAX 9 moments after takeoff. NTSB Chair Jennifer Hamadi criticized Boeing in scathing testimony to a Senate committee Wednesday. Boeing has not provided us with the documents and information that we have requested numerous times over the past few months. Investigators' initial findings determined that four critical bolts that literally hold the door to the jet's fuselage were missing. Boeing says it had provided the detailed information, including a full list of individuals on the 737 door team to the NTSB. But adds in a statement, if a door plug removal had not been documented, it would have no documentation to share. Today, after a long inspection process, the plane involved in that blowout, along with the entire fleet, is back in the air. Now, the NTSB chair did confirm that those inspections have not turned up any missing bolts on any MAX 9s in service. The FAA also said this week an audit of Boeing's manufacturing line found multiple instances of failure to comply with quality control procedures. FAA giving Boeing 90 days to implement a plan to address that. Boeing says it will do. It is doing exactly that. Savannah? All right, Tom, thank you so much. Yeah. New research from the National Sleep Foundation shows teens may be struggling to get a good night's sleep. According to a recent survey, eight out of every 10 teenagers feels they aren't getting enough Z's at night. And the impact is far reaching. Data shows the lack of sleep could have a major impact on mental health. Let's bring in Dr. Joseph Derjetsky to explain this new report. He's the vice president of research and scientific affairs at the National Sleep Foundation. Doctor, good to have you with us. So walk us through some of the results of this study. Why do teens need more sleep yeah. than adults. Yes, well, first, thanks for having me and good morning to you. So our poll uh, asked teens about their sleep habits, what time they go to sleep on school nights and weekends, things of this nature, and how they were feeling, their depressive symptoms. And what we showed, as you alluded to, was pretty striking. The vast majority of teens are not getting that National Sleep Foundation recommended eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. And that uh, is is strongly linked with how they're feeling during the day. Uh, we show that one out of every three teens has mild or greater levels of depressive symptoms, and three out of four teens is directly reporting that their emotional well being is in fact negatively impacted when they're sleeping less than usual. So, a pretty strong association. Teens need this eight to 10 hours of sleep because of all the demands they're facing, because of the, the, the natural growth they're experiencing, uh, their, their developmental processes, everything they're trying to learn. We, we simply just need this eight to 10 hours of sleep at this important developmental phase. The survey found, of course, sleep health and mental health are closely linked, especially for teens. So kind of give us some information around that. How does sleep regulate emotions? What happens when teens have trouble sleeping multiple nights a week when it comes to their mental health? Yeah, importantly, I must say at the, at the onset that it's likely a two-way road. But what I mean by that is that 
poor sleep can certainly lead to and cause emotional difficulties, but emotional difficulties also are known to carry sleep as a symptom. But when we, when we dig a little deeper, we've all experienced these poor nights of sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you're more likely to interpret the world around you in a negative way. You're more likely to focus on those, those unwanted occurrences when you sleep well, when you wake up feeling energized and refreshed, you're more likely to, to tackle the world around you, to interpret things positively, to maybe not focus as much on negative events. During sleep, we process, we process our, our uh, you know, we do a lot of emotional processing, uh, memory consolidation. We're more likely to get out and get active when we sleep. All of these things are certainly related to our mental well-being as well. Excuse me. This weekend, we go back to daylight saving time. We'll spring forward, losing an hour of sleep. Mm -hmm. What's the impact of this time change? Do we need to stop doing this two times a year? Certainly, National Sleep Foundation has adopted a position that we should stop the clock change and stick to permanent standard time. The reason is pretty clear. First, when we move to daylight saving time, we're losing that one hour of sleep opportunity. But following that clock change, there's this chronic misalignment between the outside world and our internal body clocks. We sleep best when we get exposure to nice bright light in the morning and when the evening is relatively dark and dim. During daylight saving time, for the majority of us, we're getting darkness well into the morning hours and then bright light into the evening. This can result in poor sleep. We know that during daylight saving time, there's an increased risk of car crashes. There is increased risk for accidents, for a whole host of physical ailments. Again, the bulk of that data has certainly led National Sleep Foundation to adopt a position that permanent standard time is the correct choice. All right, doctor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you, have a good one. Coming up, it is a blue-tinted beauty that's caught the curious eye of several spring breakers on Texas's Gulf Coast. After the break, we'll tell you about it. It's called a blue dragon, and experts say while it might look fun to play around with, you should definitely look, not touch. They're warning to beachgoers. Up next. We're back now with a closer look at the lawsuit Elon Musk has filed against the artificial intelligence company he helped create. Musk is suing OpenAI and co-founders Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, alleging they abandoned their original mission. NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez has more. Tech giants at war. Billionaire Elon Musk taking on OpenAI, complaining the nonprofit he helped fund is now a for-profit entity with ties to Microsoft. Suddenly it's like a $90 billion for-profit corporation with closed source. I don't know how you go from here to there, but that seems like a, I don't know how you get, I don't know, if, is this legal? <laughs> Musk is now suing the company and its founders, alleging in part that its entire development is built in secrecy. It should be named, renamed Super Closed Source for Maximum Profit AI. Um, <laughs> so, because this is what it actually is. I think Musk does things because he's got a pretty strong passion uh, for what he feels has to be done on AI. Walter Isaacson penned Elon Musk's official biography. He says the billionaire has long been concerned about big tech dominance in the AI space. He was worried that two big companies, Google and Microsoft, might someday control AI. So he and Sam Altman started OpenAI. What Musk wanted was it for to be open, open source, and nonprofit. And that was what they decided. Just let me know what you need help with. We took to ChatGPT an OpenAI product to see what it had to say. In one word, is OpenAI open? In one word, I would say partially. Partially how? OpenAI operates with a mix of openness and proprietary practices. While it releases some research and models to the public, it also retains certain technologies and capabilities for commercial purposes. Now OpenAI is moving to dismiss Elon's claims, releasing emails that allegedly showed the tech founder agreed that parts of the company's science could be closed. At one point in 2018, Elon reportedly suggested a merger with Tesla to stay competitive. We may wish it otherwise, but Tesla is the only path that could even hope to hold a candle to Google. The law is pretty unclear in the sense of 
can you sue a nonprofit for becoming a for-profit? But as Musk said, hey, wait a minute. If this can happen, anybody can do it. Our thanks to Elwin Lopez for that report. Financial headlines now, starting with some new numbers out this morning on America's labor market. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with those new numbers as well as other money headlines. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, we're getting a fresh snapshot on the labor market. This is a day before the monthly jobs report. All right, jobless claims coming in line with expectations, 217,000 claims settling at a pretty healthy level as the labor market continues to show strength in the face of elevated interest rates. Now, to put things into perspective, in total, 1.9 million Americans were collecting jobless benefits during the week that ended February 24th. All right, Max is the next streaming service to crack down on password sharing. The head of the Warner Brothers streaming business says Max will start limiting people sharing passwords outside their household later this year. That brings Max in line with Netflix and Disney, which have done so while adjusting prices to make their cheaper ad-supported plans more attractive. And listen to this. Campbell's is putting grilled cheese in a can. The company has launched a new variety that combines two favorite comfort foods, grilled cheese and tomato soup. The limited edition condensed soup is made with three kinds of cheese, cheddar, Monterey Jack, and a semi-soft cheese similar to Munster. One fan compares it to SpaghettiOs without the noodles. The new soup will roll out to all, st to all stores ahead of National Grilled Cheese Day on April 12th. That, is how it, does that sound? I'm I don't interested. Know, I feel like that's it, something I'm I'd interested, taste but test. it sounds heavy. Yeah, is it too much to dip a grilled cheese in you the know, grilled cheese soup? I was thinking the same thing, Joe. I was mm. thinking the same thing. No, if it's kind of spaghetti, <laughs> is it too dish, much? I say it's no. never too much. All right, so not, not too much. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, researchers are now warning beachgoers to be careful as they head out for spring break this season. There's something called a blue dragon, and it's been washing up on beaches in Texas recently. And while they look pretty cool, they can be dangerous. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now from Galveston, Texas, with more. Priscilla, good morning. Savannah, good morning. These rare creatures can be found in the waters in the south, but this time of year they also can start washing up and you might spot them as you're walking along the beach or playing in the sand with the kids. And while they may look really, really cool and they're actually super tiny, only about the size of a quarter when they wash up, experts are warning they are nothing to play with. Whoa. What is this? It's a sight many beachgoers have never seen. It's a Pokemon! Oh. It's actually known as a blue dragon, and you should not catch them all. Though the bright blue and silver sea slugs may look like fun. This is what they look like. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. If you were to see one of these on the beach, what would you do? I've tried to pick it up. I would have touched it. It is cool looking, yeah. but I yeah. have heard that they're really dangerous. She's right. As spring breakers flock to beaches, researchers are warning that wherever there's warm water, these tiny creatures are likely around and they can pack a very mean sting. It would be a three to five times what a man of war sting would be. Jace Tunnel is a marine biologist who has spent years combing the beaches in Texas. And this is what the blue dragon feeds on. Right, exactly. Blue dragons feed on toxins from the Portuguese man o' war and other jellyfish like organisms. Toxins that the blue dragon will release if threatened or agitated. You will know immediately if you are stung by a blue dragon. It will be intense pain. It will feel like uh, somebody has needles that they're scraping across um, your skin. Bad reactions can cause vomiting and disorientation, prompting a trip to the ER. If you're stung, experts say do pour vinegar or warm water on the site, but don't get in the ocean or rub it with sand. And those blue dragons don't have to ruin your day at the beach either if you follow one simple rule. Leave it alone. Uh, they should take photos of it, but do not touch it. Oh, wow, Priscilla, they really are something to look at. But what are people who have kids or pets and they're headed to the beach? What can they do to stay safe? 
Yeah, of course. Kids love to touch bright, pretty things. And so experts say just try to have a conversation with your kids before you come to the beach. Let them know if they see anything that they don't recognize, especially if there's a lot of blue stuff on the beach, to talk to an adult before they touch anything. And you also want to keep a close eye on pets. But like you heard there, folks are welcome to take pictures, uh, welcome to admire those beautiful creatures, but just resist the urge to touch them. Savannah? Ooh. All right, Priscilla, thank you. Well, coming up, we are flipping the script on this Thursday morning. Enter Jermaine Fowler, a side-splitting writer, comedian, actor, and producer whose latest film, Ricky Stenicki, is out today on Prime Video. He joins us next on his meteoric rise to fame and working with the legendary Eddie Murphy on Coming to America. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. As most of us know, it's Women's History Month. Tomorrow, March 8th, is International Women's Day. And this Saturday, March 9th, is Barbie's 65th birthday. So to celebrate it all, Barbie just announced eight new dolls joining its role models collection. Unfortunately, they're not for sale, but each honoree receives their very own one-of-a-kind doll. This year, there are some big names on the list, like Viola Davis, Shania Twain, Helen Mirren. Mattel says the line was created to introduce girls to remarkable women's stories and show them that they can truly be anything. Pretty cool. That is very cool. Thank you, Savannah. Mm -hmm. Finally this hour, our series Flipping the Script, featuring people on air, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter Jermaine Fowler, a hilarious actor who stars in the new movie, Ricky Stenicki, which is out today on Amazon Video. You may recognize him from films like Sorry to Bother You, Judas and the Black Messiah, The Blackening, and Coming to America, the sequel to the 80s hit. Jermaine, good to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us. Anytime, anytime. All right, so this oh, Ricky... Oh, wait, hold on, I got you. Uh oh, oh. Uh, a, a fake. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, mean, yeah. real? Is it real? Props is it, trying to throw stuff We're going to put. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate thank that. Thank you, Props. Well, thank you. That means the world to me. All right. Time. So, Ricky Stenicki, <laughs> it is out today. Yeah. The director is Peter Farrelly of the mm -hmm. Farrelly Brothers. So, we think, I mean, I think of Peter Farrelly. He did Dumb and Dumber. Uh -huh. He did The Green Book. I mean, there's yeah. not two movies that could be further apart. Yeah, this yeah. one. Maybe more like Dumb and Dumber. What should we know about this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ricky Stadicki, it's about a group of friends who get caught up in a lie, and that lie comes back to bite him in the ass in the form of Ricky Stadicki, played by John Cena. Um, I've been a fan of uh, Fairly movies since, um, ah, man, uh, th There's Something About Mary. Yeah. You know, that's, my, that's one of my favorite, like, movies ever. I, I can quote it from top to bottom, so it was an honor to work with this dude. Yeah, what was it like working, A, with him and also with just John Cena? You know, I've been, again, I'm a wrestling fan, so John Cena, again, like, uh, it was just, uh, it, it was wonderful. And he's a great dude. He's very gracious, very generous, and uh, just, we had a great time. Let's talk about how you got interested in comedy. From what I've read, you were in 11th grade and a friend gave you a copy of, of Eddie Murphy Raw, yeah, right? Yeah, Brady, yeah. Yeah, and what, what, when you watched that, what was it that made you say, oh yeah, I like this, this is what I want to do? I think it was the jacket. <laughs> I think it was the so jacket. Just, there you go. Yeah, now yeah, you yeah. have your jacket. Um, man, I think uh, I, I've been, I think the, the first Eddie Murphy movie I saw from my generation was Mulan. You know what I mean? Like, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm 35, so Mulan was rotated heavy in my house. And then I just circled backwards, like, and watched everything else. And I'm like, whoa. And then I got addicted to Bowfinger. Like, Bowfinger's one of my favorite movies. You know, it's just, it's a, genu it's a genius movie. So uh, I got the tape and uh, knew I wasn't going to go to college. So I was like, you know what? I think I, I, I'm going to try that out. I'm going to try that out. And uh, I, guess, I guess it worked out. So you have this full circle moment when all of a sudden you are playing his son in Coming to America 2. I mean, when you realized that you were going to be with your icon, what did that mean to you? I mean, how would you feel? You know? well, I mean, you know what I'm it's saying? one of those things where you're like, uh, what? does it scare you? No. Does it motivate you? I mean, no, you... It w it, it, I guess uh, a bit of validation. Also, um, I'm, I'm very present, so I... I just took it in and just had a great time. He's, uh, I, I, I say this all the time, uh, you know, they, they say never meet your heroes. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy I met that man. Well, what did you he learn was, from him? Uh, I kind of like, I watched. I watched and sponged it in, you know? Uh, his present was a gift, you know what I mean? So I just, uh, his presence was so like, I just, I just took it all in, you know? And the things, you know, we shared, uh, I, I kind of keep that personal because I waited so long to, you know, work with that man and like, you know, uh, uh, it, it, I, I try to keep all those things with me because, um, you know, they're my, they're my memories, actually. <laughs> in the same way that he was an inspiration for you, you're probably maybe starting to realize you are an inspiration to a lot of young people who are, like, looking at you and saying, 
I want to I want to do exactly what you're doing. I mean, do you think about that? And what's sort of your message to people who want to follow in your footsteps? Wow, I. I, I don't know. That's really crazy to think about, honestly. Um, Did I give you a deep question there? No, I, it, it, I never thought about it. I, I never really think about that. I just uh, remember when I first started, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. It was very lonely. And uh, I was on the road uh, doing shows nonstop. And I was so, so driven. Nothing could stop me. And no one could tell me what I was doing was dumb. I was told that many times by friends and family, and it just never stopped me. So if you have a dream, just keep, keep going. Keep going no matter what. I wanted to ask you, there was a comedy horror movie. Yes, there is such a thing called The Blackening that you did. It was mm -hmm. an all-black cast, and it had to <laughs> me the best tagline I think I've ever seen in a movie, which is, we can't all die first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you watch horror movies, right? I, I'm not a huge fan, to be honest then you, you with gotta you. Understand. Are you. Are you a fan? Hell yeah, okay. yes. No, I, I love horror movies. You gotta understand where that comes from. Like, the trope in yeah. uh, uh, most horror movies is that uh, black folks, uh, the only black guy in the horror movies, they usually die first. Right. And Dwayne and, and Tracy, they came up with the genius concept, which is, uh, well, what if the whole cast was black? <laughs> they all can't die first. And it uh, it just hit. It was, a, it was a fun, that was probably some of the most fun I've had on set. Really? Yeah, Tim Story, the director, just let me go nuts. Like it was, it was, it was so collaborative. Uh, the cast, we still, you know, have a group chat. We chat on, you know, nonstop, and uh, we and all. There might be a sequel, other. right? I, I mean, fingers crossed. I, I think so. I think so. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, I, I think they're writing it right now. We have like 45 seconds left here, but for you, what's next? Is there something you haven't done yet that you're like, this is what I want to do? So, <laughs> plenty. <laughs> Plenty. There's so much. But also, like, I, um, I feel like we live in a day and age where, like, I don't know, like, uh, I, I want to surprise people with it. You know, I want to, I wanna, you know, just want to show people and not tell, you know. So um, I, the answer is yes, and I can't wait for you to see it. So people are just going to have to hold on and yeah. wait and see it. All yeah, right. Yeah. Ricky Stenicki out today on mm -hmm. Amazon Video for folks to check out. Zach Efron, John Cena. Andrew Santino. Very good. Yeah. And yeah, Jermaine yeah. Fowler. Thank you so William much. William H. Macy. Us. Thank you. Man. There we go. So, yeah, I know. It's a lot of stars in that. It's one a lot too. of good, man. It's a good movie. All right. Good to have you with us this Thank morning. You. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The Don't news touch continues the blue right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.